Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter in Washington. Today is November 30, 1979, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 52. Where will you be, my friends, if nuclear fireballs begin erupting soon over the United States of America? If war comes, will you be among the majority of Americans who will be caught by surprise, or will you be among the few who will have escaped from target areas in time? I pray that war will not come, but at this very moment the world is teetering dangerously close to thermonuclear catastrophe, and if it happens, air raid sirens and radio alerts will come too late. It will be like Hiroshima just after dawn on August 6, 1945. Radio Hiroshima began to broadcast an air raid alert, but never finished. It was cut short by the unearthly flash of a second dawn as a man-made sun rose over the city. These are the true stakes, my friends, in the present crisis over American hostages in Iran. The hostages are only helpless pawns in a deadly chess game behind the scenes. For more than two years now a worldwide secret war has been underway. The secret war is between the new rulers of Russia and the overthrown rulers of Russia, the Bolsheviks now here in America. Last month I reported that, quote, the secret war may soon surface in very spectacular ways. When that happens, most people still will not know the reasons for what they see, but the events themselves will make headlines the world over." Unquote. Eight days after I recorded those words in AUDIO LETTER No. 51, the present crisis in Iran suddenly began. The American Embassy in Tehran was overrun, supposedly by Iranian students, and more than 60 hostages were taken. Today, more than three weeks later, some 50 Americans are still being held hostage. Day by day the crisis has deepened. On both sides there has been confusion and one contradiction after another. Iran, like the United States, is speaking with several voices in the crisis because Iran, like the United States, is a battleground in this secret war. The real reason for the Iran crisis is one that I warned about 15 months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 37. The Bolsheviks here in America have created a plan to launch an American nuclear first strike against Russia. The plan has been updated and revised continuously since I first revealed it in AUDIO LETTER No. 37, but the underlying military strategy has not changed at all, and Iran is an indispensable key to that strategy. The Bolsheviks intend for the Iran crisis to cause American and other troops to pour into Iran. As a pretext, we will be told that it has become necessary for America to seize Iran's oil fields and facilities to keep Iranian oil flowing, but the real purpose will be to get ready fast for a sneak attack on Russia. This is the real meaning of the Iran crisis, and yet the crisis so far is not going according to Bolshevik plan. For the past six months the Russians have been seizing control of certain key positions of power here in the United States. Up to now Russia's new rulers have relatively few agents here compared to the vast number of the Bolshevik enemies, but the Russians are working from the top down for maximum leverage. They were unable to prevent the Iran crisis, but they are using their new power here to alter its course. Up to now the Russians have been able to keep their Bolshevik enemies here in America off balance in the Iran crisis. Two months ago, in the crisis over Russian troops in Cuba, they were content to make the whole affair just fizzle out, but this time the chess players in the Kremlin are shooting for checkmate. They are having to calculate their moves very quickly, but they are calculating carefully because their goal is to wreck the Bolshevik war plan built around Iran. Right now, my friends, the world is staggering along like a blindfolded man, only inches away from the unseen chasm of nuclear war. If the Russian maneuvering is successful, we will be pulled a step toward safety, but one wrong move 
and the Bolsheviks here in America will push us over the edge. My three special topics this month are Topic No. 1, Strategic Iran and the Islamic Khomeini Revolution. Topic No. 2, The Bolshevik Iran Strategy for Thermonuclear War. And Topic No. 3, American Hostages and the Battle of Tehran. Topic No. 1. The Iran crisis was triggered by an event here in the United States late last month. On October 22, the deposed Shah of Iran arrived in New York City ostensibly for medical treatment. As a result, tempers boiled over fast in Iran, and in less than two weeks the United States Embassy in Tehran was attacked and seized. To understand the headlines of today about Iran, you need to know why and how the Shah was deposed. You deserve to know some key facts about the Khomeini Government which the news media are not telling you. Also, there are certain things about the religion of Islam itself which you must know, because otherwise you will be unable to interpret what you see happening in the Iran crisis. Only a short two months ago we Americans were preoccupied with a different crisis. We were worried not about American hostages in Iran, but about reports of a Russian combat brigade in Cuba. And a year ago this month there was a fake alarm over Russian MiG-23 fighters in Cuba. Yet during the days of the Shah, Iran amounted to a super Cuba against Russia. Iran is 15 times the size of Cuba with three times the population, and the Shah was turning it into an armed camp as an American puppet. The Iranian Army was being whipped into a large modern fighting force. The very latest in America's supersonic fighters, the F-14, was being shipped to Iran in great numbers, complete with the advanced Phoenix missile. And the Iranian Navy was growing steadily. American-made warships were being shipped to Iran with equipment even more sophisticated than that supplied to the United States Navy. Over the years we have heard often about the 60 to 70,000 Russians in Cuba. But how often have we heard our robotoy President say in a press conference, as he did just two nights ago, quote, I think one of the points that should be made is that a year ago we had 70,000 Americans in Iran, 70,000." Iran was becoming a great engine of war fueled by Iranian oil, and at the controls sat the Shah of Iran, a puppet of the Rockefeller cartel. But the strength of the Shah was also his weakness. His secret police force, the Savak, was hated and dreaded universally by Iranians. As many as 60,000 Iranians may have died at the hands of the Savak, many of them under torture. And meanwhile, at the urging of his then masters, the Rockefellers, the Shah was trying to remake Iran in the Western mode. Some Iranians welcomed these changes, but others only resented them. To them, Western influences, especially from America, met support for the Shah's reign of terror. This turned everything Western into a symbol of hate and fear. And most of all, millions felt that the Shah was turning Iran away from her ancient roots as an Islamic society. Islam was founded 1400 years ago by the Prophet Muhammad. Muslims believe that God communicated directly to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel and that Muhammad wrote those words down. The collection of these writings is known as the Quran. The religion based on the Quran is called Islam and its adherents Moslems. Islam is a major force in the world, especially in the Middle East, Africa, and Southern Asia. There are as many Moslems in the world as there are Roman Catholics, around 700 million, and yet most of us in the West have no understanding at all of Islam. Instead, we are in the habit of looking at the Moslem world through Western eyes, and that always leaves us bewildered. Our ignorance of Islam is so great that not so long ago Moslems were typically called Mohammedans by Western Christians, and since we Christians worship Christ, it is often assumed that the people we wrongly call Mohammedans worship Mohammed. But nothing could be more offensive to a Moslem. The basic tenet of Islam is that there is no God but Allah, and Mohammed is His Prophet. Allah is the Moslem name for God. Muhammad's memory is loved and revered 
but he is not worshipped. The Quran, the Holy Book of Islam, is not a book of laws, nor is Muhammad thought of as a lawgiver like Moses. Instead, the Quran is an eloquent appeal to mankind, and especially to the Arabs, to obey the law of God. Over and over the Quran states that the law of God has already been revealed to the Jews and to the Christians. In fact, in one passage the Quran tells the pious Moslem, if he has any doubt, to consult those to whom the Scriptures have been revealed previously. Even so, it is a great mistake to expect Moslems to think in terms that are familiar to us. For one thing, we in the West tend to separate religion from other areas of life such as business, law, and diplomacy. To a devout Moslem this is unthinkable, for in Islam religion is life itself. In the present crisis over Iran, several very important points of Moslem law and diplomacy are involved. The Moslem approach in these matters is not the same as in the West. Instead, they have been derived down through the centuries from the Quran, from examples set by the Prophet himself, and from other sources. Once you become aware of these things, I think the Iran crisis may begin to take on a different appearance in important ways. I'm about to give you several important quotations from a highly authoritative book on these matters. It is titled, Law in the Middle East, Volume 1, by Majid Kaduri, K-H-A-D-D-U-R-I, and Herbert J. Lebesny. It was published in 1955 by the Middle East Institute here in Washington, D.C. First, in the West we generally think in terms of separation of church and state, but, quote, Islam, in contrast to Christianity, combined both the religious and civil authority in the hands of the head of the state." Unquote. Before Islam was founded, the Arab world was a scene of continual fighting, intertribal warfare, with raids for robbery or vendettas, but, quote, Islam abolished all wars except the jihad, that is, the holy war, unquote. It had to be, quote, war that would spread the belief in Allah and make His Word supreme over the world." Unquote. No other kind of war was legally permitted. In addition, the jihad quote, had to be conducted according to certain specific rules in order to be just. The violation of these rules deprived the jihad of its religious sanction and entailed punishment by Allah or the Imam, whether in this world or the next." Unquote. The first of these rules is that, quote, the jihad was a required duty of the whole Muslim community, binding the Muslims in mass rather than individually, unquote. The second rule is that, quote, the jihad may be regarded as a doctrine of permanent war, unquote. But thirdly, quote, the jihad, though a doctrine of permanent war, did not necessarily mean continuous fighting. The objective of the jihad was not fighting per se, but the conversion of unbelievers to Islam. If means other than fighting were used, such as propaganda or persuasion, then the jihad duty was fulfilled. The essence of the doctrine was that the Muslims could not relax their effort to convert the unbelievers." Unquote. And finally, quote, the validity of the jihad depended on the observance of certain rules. The Imam had to declare the jihad to invite the unbelievers to adopt Islam before fighting began, and to agree to negotiations if they were requested by the enemy before actual fighting had taken place." Unquote. Beyond these general rules, there is one more point of Islamic law which bears directly on the present Iran crisis. It has to do with the treatment of hostages. Quote, the system of taking human hostages to ensure the sanctity of treaties was followed by the Moslems. If the treaty were violated, however, the Moslems did not kill the hostages. If the Moslems started the war, the hostages were sent back home. But if the war was started by the other party, 
then the hostages were kept." Unquote. In other words, my friends, under Moslem law the worst that can legally be done to hostages is to keep them indefinitely. Their position as hostages cannot justify their being killed. The hostages in Tehran, my friends, are there in connection with a jihad led by Ayatollah Khomeini. He has publicly proclaimed that Iran is embarked on a holy war against America, the great Satan." Quote, unquote. He has called upon all Muslims everywhere to join in the struggle, and yet the Ayatollah is being manipulated by forces which he may not understand. When the Shah was in power, he was building up Iran for war purposes which had nothing to do with a jihad, and as he westernized his country, he also terrorized it. As a result, many pockets of discontent and opposition developed against the Shah. One of the most forceful of these was Ayatollah Khomeini. Ayatollah Khomeini was an implacable foe of the Shah for many years before we began hearing about him here in the United States. The Ayatollah had good reason to know the character of the Shah's regime. Years ago the agents of the Shah tortured and murdered one of the sons of the Ayatollah, and a generation ago the present Shah's father executed Ayatollah Khomeini's father. And so even when he was driven into exile, the Ayatollah did not cease in his efforts against the Shah's regime. From his places of exile he continued to appeal to his followers in Iran. He exhorted them to turn away from the Shah and turn back to Islam, and in accordance with the Shiite Muslim beliefs he extolled martyrdom in service to God as something to be desired. He told his followers to oppose the Shah without fear, accepting martyrdom as a reward if it should come. The Ayatollah spent fourteen long years in exile most of them without seriously threatening the Shah's regime. And yet early this year of 1979 Ayatollah Khomeini returned in triumph to Tehran. In less than a year's time a revolution had suddenly crystallized around him. The sudden rise in the Ayatollah's political fortunes took place for reasons he could never have suspected. It all began two years ago this month in November 1977. In mid-month the Shah of Iran made a sudden rush-rush trip here to Washington, D.C., but news about the Shah's mysterious trip was practically lost in the headlines about another unexpected rush trip. It was the week of the trip to Jerusalem by Egypt's President Sadat. The two trips were closely related, as I revealed that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 28. Two months earlier Russia had begun the rapid deployment of a secret arsenal of space weapons, her new space triad. The controlled Carter Administration was reeling from the shock, but in November 1977 the sudden trips by Sadat and the Shah were the shaky beginnings of America's shift to a first-strike strategy. When the Shah discovered just how crucial Iran was becoming militarily, he decided to demand better reimbursement by the Rockefeller Cartel for services rendered. A consortium of 14 oil companies marketed Iran's oil under contract, and it was contract renewal time. The Shah said he was willing to renew, but only on more favorable terms. Hearing that and other demands, the late David Rockefeller began thinking his Shah was expendable and this new situation might offer an opportunity to get rid of British Petroleum as an unwanted partner. Originally the Iranian oil fields had been controlled by Britain, but in 1953 the Rockefellers had acquired major concessions in Iran as the price of restoring the pliable Shah to his throne. By 1977 BP was down to only a 40% share in Iran's oil while the Rockefeller Cartel controlled 49%. But as usual, David Rockefeller wanted the whole pie. British Petroleum was an arch-rival to be knocked out if possible, and so Rockefeller gave an assignment to what was then still his private detective agency, the CIA. They were to figure out how to get rid of the Shah in such a way that it would also knock out BP. 
but the CIA was also ordered to make sure that any plan they developed could also be used militarily. The CIA planners concluded that the only way to get rid of British Petroleum in Iran would be to disband the consortium of oil companies. In other words, the Shah should be removed in favor of someone who would nationalize the Iranian oil industry. For decades the Rockefellers had made a specialty of re-establishing their own effective control over nationalized industries, as I have indicated in AUDIO LETTER No. 40 about Guyana and other tapes. As for the military factor, surprise had become the number one consideration. In view of Russia's newly deployed space triad, most of the Shaw's expensive weapons were no longer of much use. They could still be used in regional conflicts, but that was no longer of interest. Nothing mattered anymore except the ability to mount a surprise attack on Russia from Iran, and that would have to be done using secret weapons instead of the Shaw's impressive-looking conventional weapons. So it was concluded that there was no military reason not to overthrow the Shaw, and in fact Overthrowing the Shah held out the possibility of greater military surprise against Russia. To do this the new regime would have to be one that did not want to continue the Shah's military programs. That would cause a dramatic collapse of Iran as a highly visible military threat to Russia, but it was also essential that whoever followed the Shah be less efficient organizationally than the Shah. This would allow covert activities to continue in Iran without the new regime being aware of it. The CIA then carried out a search for a candidate individual or group to replace the Shaw. They were not looking for a puppet this time. Instead, the concept was to find someone having certain characteristics who could be maneuvered without their knowledge into serving the intended purposes. The search ended by identifying Ayatollah Khomeini. He fit the profile of desired characteristics. He was violently anti-Shaw. His position as a religious leader provided an ideal base for political power, yet his group was weak organizationally and lacked administrative experience. Even the Ayatollah's fascination with martyrdom looked ideal to the war planners because the government of Ayatollah Khomeini is to be sacrificed to a military purpose. It is Guyana all over again, but on a grand scale. One year ago this month, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 40, the deliberate mass human sacrifice at Jonestown had a military purpose. It was to achieve surprise and the destruction of the secret Russian missile base about which I had warned publicly for over four years. This time human sacrifice in Iran is intended to lead to the destruction of Russia herself. And so after a dozen years in obscurity the calls of Ayatollah Khomeini suddenly started picking up steam. In countless ways the CIA began multiplying Khomeini's impact in Iran. Cassette tapes of the Ayatollah's fiery speeches flooded the country. Photos of the Ayatollah began to multiply, becoming a rallying point for opposition to the Shah and covert CIA agents began organizing the pro-Khomeini opposition to the Shah into a potent political force. And in the process the powerful Bolsheviks here in America were able to put some of their own agents close to the inner circles of Ayatollah Khomeini. In August 1978 I alerted my listeners that the riot in Iran was a serious threat to the Shah's regime. Four months later in AUDIO LETTER No. 41 I reported that none other than the Shah's former supporters, the Rockefeller Cartel, were causing his troubles. By early the following month, January 1979, the Shah's regime was visibly falling apart. The Deputy to General Alexander Haig, the NATO commander, was then sent to Iran on orders from Washington. There he met with top Iranian military leaders. Following orders, the NATO Deputy Commander Major General Robert E. Heiser talked Iran's military out of stage in a coup d'etat. Washington's unstated purpose in ordering General Heiser to Iran was to clear the way for Ayatollah Khomeini. The old Hegelian principle thesis, antithesis, 
and synthesis was at work. Step 1. Remove the powerful shawl. Step 2. Replace him with an interim straw man, the unpopular Bakhtiar Government. And Step 3. Allow this weak straw man to be knocked down by Ayatollah Khomeini. But the Rockefeller Cartel was afraid the Iranian military would substitute their own Step 3. The military wanted to set up a stable, moderate pro-West regime. The CIA First Strike planners wanted anything but stability in Iran, and so the Iranian military leaders were talked out of staging a coup. Later on they were tried for treason and executed by the Khomeini Government. On January 16, 1979, the Shah fled from Iran. Barely two weeks later, on January 31, the Ayatollah made his triumphal return to Tehran. The unseen, unsuspected CIA support for the Islamic Khomeini Revolution had done its job. That is what CIA Director Stansfield Turner meant in a statement he made only four days later on February 4. On the ABC television news program Issues and Answers, Turner said, quote, I would suggest even Ayatollah Khomeini didn't realize how well his force was moving along." Unquote. Even so, an event took place only one week after the Ayatollah's return which might still have ended the Khomeini Revolution. When the old man and some aides came out the door of the Khomeini headquarters on February 7, 1979, an assassin was waiting. He shot the old man in the chest with an arsenic-coated, high-powered bullet. All efforts to save him were useless, and that night the old man died. For several hours the British news agency Reuters carried bulletins that the Ayatollah had been reported killed, but there were no such bulletins by American news agencies because the Rockefeller Cartel here knew that Ayatollah Khomeini was not dead. The old man who was shot to death in Tehran last February 1979 was a double. He was a devoted Shiite follower of his beloved Ayatollah Khomeini. He knew, like everyone else in the Khomeini inner circle, that efforts would be made to assassinate the Ayatollah. But as a devout Shiite Muslim, the double welcomed the prospect of martyrdom as a sacred privilege, and so he willingly gave his life to ensure the success of the Islamic Khomeini Revolution. And as we all know, the Revolution did succeed, but the cruel fact is that it was secretly helped along by Satanic forces who planned to undo it all. They planned to martyr the entire Khomeini Government as they set off thermonuclear war. Topic No. 2 The present crisis in Iran is the outgrowth of the CIA plan set in motion two years ago by David Rockefeller, but the four Rockefeller brothers did not live to see their war plans carried out. Instead, the remains of Rockefeller power are being carved up today by two bitter enemies on the world stage. They are the joint heirs of the situation created in Iran by the CIA, and now they are both struggling for control in the Iran crisis. As the Shah of Iran was being overthrown in the early days of 1979, the Rockefellers were being overthrown here in America. Just ten days after the Shah fled from Iran, Nelson Rockefeller was murdered in New York City. It was the beginning of a Bolshevik coup d'etat against the Rockefellers. The Bolshevik purge here in the United States continued out of the public eye. By late February 1979, the new Khomeini regime was taking hold in Iran, and at the same time the Bolsheviks were taking control here in America. When these changes were taking place, there were headlines about Iran, but no hint of the Bolshevik coup here in the United States. As they picked up the reins of Rockefeller power and CIA planning, the Bolsheviks were in a hurry. The Bolsheviks are being expelled from their former positions of power in Russia, and they want to get even. They were trying to trigger a Middle East war by mid-May 1979 on the way to a nuclear first strike against Russia, and at the same time they were planning to throw the world's 700 million Roman Catholics 
into their war against Russia. The Bolsheviks were planning to set off what was to be known as the Pope's Revolution in Eastern Europe. I gave the details of the plan in AUDIO LETTER No. 42. The key to the plan was to be the Papal visit to Poland on the 900th anniversary of the martyrdom of St. Stanislaus. For a while the Bolshevik war plans were moving fast, but around Easter 1979 the Russians began intervening here in the United States. They began deploying their organic robotoids as I first revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 46. Using them in the Middle East shuttles I described that month, the Russians prevented a Middle East war in May. Likewise, they were able to spoil the Bolshevik plan for a Pope's revolution. In early May the Russians began eliminating Bolshevik influence in the Vatican, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 46, and the Pope's visit to Poland was rescheduled for June. By then the emotion surrounding St. Stanislaus Day had cooled off and there was no trouble. Ever since that time the United States has been a battleground in a secret war between the Russians and the Bolsheviks here. Over the months I have been keeping you informed about these developments. The Bolsheviks here are still trying to find a way to throw America's military power at Russia in a knockout punch. Russia's new Christian rulers are countering by a campaign to disarm the United States, starting with the SALT II Treaty. As of now, both sides, the Russians and their Bolshevik enemies, exert great power here in the United States. Russian power here is based on their agents, both human and robotoid, in top positions of power but the Bolsheviks began infiltrating our land 30 years ago. Today they are in every nook and cranny of America, especially the military. So the Bolshevik strategy now is to find ways to circumvent Russia's control at the top. In AUDIO LETTER No. 46 I revealed how Russia prevented a Middle East war in May by means of secret Middle East shuttles. But I also revealed that their shuttles involving Iran were meeting with complete failure. Unknown to Ayatollah Khomeini, Iran was and still is swarming with Bolshevik Zionist agents, and they have been able to keep Russia virtually locked out of Iran up to now. Even so, just over two months ago Russia did succeed in establishing a way to monitor what goes on around the Ayatollah. Doing this had become a top priority for Russia. Russian intelligence agents had uncovered evidence that the Bolsheviks here in America were once again moving fast toward war. Once again the Bolsheviks were working toward a nuclear first strike against Russia, and just as before, Iran was to be used somehow as the key to the plan. But the Russians did not know exactly how Iran was to be used until late September two months ago. By the time Russian intelligence had pieced it all together, there was no time to be lost. The joint Bolshevik-Zionist war plan called for a sequence of events to begin on November 20, and once it began, the chain reaction toward war was designed to be very hard to stop. As of late September 1979, the new Bolshevik war plan consisted of six major steps. Step 1 was to be a series of incidents beginning in Saudi Arabia during the annual pilgrimage to Mecca. The incidents were being designed by the Bolshevik Zionists to inflame Muslim rage against the United States and Israel. Step 2 was to be the American Embassy takeover in Tehran. Bolshevik Zionist agents in Iran had been feeding the resentment of the Iranian militants against the Embassy and under the cover of generalized rioting against the United States and Muslim countries, the Embassy takeover was to be staged in Tehran. At the same time, the plan was for Saudi Arabia to be growling with rage at Israel over the incidents. This would have brought the Hate Saudi Arabia campaign of a year ago out of the closet again in the Zionist media of the United States. This was to lead to Step 3 
the long-planned limited nuclear strike against Saudi Arabia's oil fields by Israel. This would have been like throwing gasoline into the firestorm of Moslem passions. 700 million Moslems would have united in the spirit of the Jihad, the Holy War, and against this backdrop the Bolshevik Zionist plan was to carry out Step 4, the slaughter of the hostages in Tehran. In Topic No. 1 I explained how any such slaughter is forbidden by Islamic law, but we Americans, knowing nothing about Islam, would have automatically blamed the Khomeini government. And with American bodies coming home from Iran like they did one year ago from Guyana, we would have cried out for revenge. In Step 5 the Bolsheviks here in America were planning to bring about a sudden no-notice mass deployment of American troops and equipment to Iran. The Bolsheviks have figured out how to do it without approval from the top where it would be vetoed by Russian agents here in America. Once the troop deployment was underway, the Bolsheviks believe it would be impossible for Russia to stop without herself triggering nuclear war, and under the cover of deployment first strike preparations would be rushed ahead by the Bolsheviks. Step 6 was to be the actual nuclear attack on Russia. This too is to occur without approval from top levels of the United States Government. The military strategy of the attack plan is still basically as it was when I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 37. The main difference now is that China's western provinces are not available to the Bolsheviks in power in the United States, so Russia's Cosmosphere installations in Central Siberia are targeted by the United States missiles in Northern Australia, which I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 42. As I also explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 42, American war planners believe incorrectly that they can succeed in getting the missiles launched. It was not until late September that the Russians were able to piece together their intelligence and deduce this total plan. By then the destabilization incidents in Saudi Arabia were less than two months away on the Bolshevik war timetable, and it was clear that some of the forces in the Bolshevik plan had already been set in motion irrevocably. Iranian militants in Tehran were already being inflamed against the United States Embassy, and the provocations in Saudi Arabia were tied directly to the Muslim calendar. The situation was like a nightmare replay of the artificial troops in Cuba crisis of two months ago. Forces had been set in motion which the Russians could not hope to stop altogether. The Russians could see only one way to block the fast-moving Bolshevik war plan. That was to do as they had done two months ago in the Cuba flap, that is, to preempt parts of the Bolshevik plan. And that, my friends, is what they are doing now in the Iran crisis. Meanwhile, their Bolshevik Zionist enemies are trying to revise their own plans and still set off nuclear war. In the secret war between the Russians and the Bolsheviks, Tehran is now the decisive battleground. Topic No. 3 In the Battle of Tehran the Russians are trying to make a shambles of the sequence of events planned by the Bolsheviks. The Bolshevik plan is to destroy Saudi Arabia's oil fields, whereas Russia is doing everything possible to prevent that. On the other hand, Iran's oil fields are to be used by the Bolsheviks as a pretext for flooding American and other troops into Iran in the preparation for the first strike. To prevent that, Russia plans to disable Iran's oil fields with airstrikes of her own if it becomes necessary. The initial step in Russia's preemptive strategy was to bring the overthrown Shah of Iran to New York City last month on October 22. To do this, the Russians used their robotoid doubles for the late David Rockefeller, Henry Kissinger, and others whom I have identified in other tapes. The Shaw was lured here with hints that he might be restored a second time to the Peacock Throne, but only his medical treatment was mentioned to the public as a cover. 
As expected, the Shoals' arrival here caused the passion stoked up by Bolshevik Zionist agents in Tehran to explode prematurely. Iranian militants there had been led to expect the United States and Israel to do something foul toward Islam in general and Iran in particular. Reacting to the Shoals' arrival here, they took over the American Embassy and took hostages on November 4. This was more than two weeks before the triggering incidents planned by the Bolsheviks for November 20, and there was no way for those incidents to be speeded up by the Bolsheviks because they were tied directly to the Muslim calendar. But immediately, as if on signal, Bolshevik Zionist agents whipped up flames of hatred against Iranian students here in the United States. On November 6, two days after the takeover, Prime Minister Mehdi Bazargan resigned. This resulted from a secret meeting one day before the Embassy takeover between Bazargan and Robotoy Zbigniew Brzezinski. It was a Russian maneuver to peel away one layer of confusion in the crisis. It thrust the Ayatollah squarely into the public eye as the only voice that really mattered in Iran, but behind the scenes that voice is being influenced by other voices. For the next several days all was confusion over Iran. Meanwhile the Bolsheviks here in America began testing their ability to launch military operations without Presidential approval. On Thursday, November 8, there was an alert for the Strategic Air Command and for paratroops of the 82nd Airborne. The next day, November 9, there was a dry run for a nuclear war. At No Red Headquarters near Colorado Springs, Colorado, a computer was fed false data indicating a missile attack on the United States. For test purposes, the false data said only a few missiles were on the way, but the result was a nuclear war alert to every command center of the United States military. All of our missile bases were placed on preliminary alert to be ready to launch if so ordered, and just for good measure several jet fighters were scrambled into the air. For six minutes the NORAD computer was preparing for a nuclear war. The computer thought it was a real attack, but there was no notice to the President, to the Secretary of Defense, or even to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, much less air raid sirens. Then the test was terminated. The Bolsheviks were satisfied. It had been a complete success, but it was not overlooked by the Russians. Three days later a similar test took place involving troops. In the pre-dawn hours of November 12, certain paratroop and other units were suddenly mobilized without previous warning. Within hours they were converging for exercises at Fort Hood, Texas. Some 2,700 soldiers were involved, drawn from the groups which the Bolsheviks here intend to deploy to Iran. Like the No Red War test, the Fort Hood exercise was actually set in motion without top-level approval, and once again the Bolsheviks were completely satisfied. In addition, American troops have already been deployed secretly to forward positions in the Middle East. For example, over 2,000 American troops have recently landed on the Omani Island of Mazira in the Arabian Sea. On November 11, my friends, the war words began heating up. That day Ayatollah Khomeini stirred Iran with a fiery speech. To the ears of Shiite Muslims it was a speech of dedication, but to Western ears it may seem to be an echo of the Guyana suicide rehearsals of Jim Jones. The Ayatollah said, quote, we are a nation of 35 million, and many of these people are looking forward to martyrdom. We will move with the 35 million. After they have all been martyred, then they can do what they want with Iran." Unquote. The next day Robotoy Jimmy Carter announced a reverse oil embargo against Iran. The Bolshevik plan to send troops to Iran is built around creating a public impression that Iranian oil 
is essential to us, which of course it is not. So to undercut that Bolshevik ploy, it was announced that the United States refuses to buy any more oil from Iran. The same day, November 12, Russian Cosmospheres were reacting to the Bolshevik triggering of exercises at Fort Hood. Russian Cosmospheres were on patrol over Spain in potential American airlift routes across the Mediterranean. That day the pilot of a Caraval jetliner in Spain saw four Cosmospheres at close range. Thinking they were UFOs, he promptly landed at the next available airport. Two days later economic war broke out between the United States and Iran. Iran announced that it was about to withdraw its deposits from United States banks, but within hours Robotoid Carter declared a national emergency, activating Presidential Emergency Powers. Under that alleged authority he froze Iran's assets here and ostensibly abroad, amounting to some $8 billion or more. The freezing of Iran's assets will lead to a collapse of the dollar abroad. That will lead in turn to inflation and depression here in the United States. In 1929 America exported its depression to the rest of the world, but this time it will be imported from the collapsing dollar market overseas. On November 14 Russia also set off an earthquake in northeastern Iran measuring 6.7 on the Richter scale. This was an attempt to distract the Khomeini government with internal problems. The next major development confounded both the Russians and the Bolsheviks. On November 16 the Khomeini government threatened to stop accepting dollars for oil. This was in retaliation for the order freezing Iranian funds here. For a few days the media were mum about Iran, and gold prices went nowhere. Having detected no particular reaction to their threat, the Iranians decided to abandon their threat for the moment about not accepting dollars. It was the law before the storm. The Iranian militants released three hostages on November 19 and ten more on November 20, but as for the rest, the Ayatollah said, quote, spying has been proven by evidence, unquote. November 20, my friends, was the fateful day in the original Bolshevik plan. It was the beginning of year 1400 in the Moslem calendar. It was the beginning of the month of Mahoram, of mourning for martyrs for the Shiite Moslems of Iran, and it marked the start of the annual Moslem pilgrimage to Mecca, Saudi Arabia. In early October Russia had alerted the Saudis through discreet channels in Kuwait to expect trouble during this year's pilgrimage. As a result, the Saudis deployed 17,000 security men in Mecca, Medina, and Jeddah. The Russians also warned the Saudis that the incidents, whatever their nature, would be coupled with evidence of American and Israeli involvement. The Saudis were warned that this was a trap designed to lure Saudi Arabia into a threatening stance toward Israel. The very survival of Saudi Arabia would depend upon the Saudis turning the other cheek, discounting these rumors, and managing the news. On November 20, large bands of armed men stormed two of Saudi Arabia's great mosques. One was the Grand Mosque in the holy city of Mecca. Three times the size of Yankee Stadium, the Grand Mosque houses within it the Kaaba the holiest shrine of Islam, the Holy of Holies. The other mosque which was attacked was the Prophet's Mosque in Medina. As soon as the incidents began, Saudi Arabia broke communications with the outside world. Crack Saudi security forces put down the Medina incident quickly, but it took days of bloody fighting to retake the Grand Mosque. Even now a few of the attackers are reported to be still holding out in the catacombs under the mosque. Through it all the Saudis were the model of restraint. It was the first attack on the Grand Mosque in a thousand years, yet the Saudis waved it all aside as if it had been a minor incident. They said the attackers were, quote, renegades 
operating outside the Moslem religion, unquote, but bit their lips rather than say more. Meanwhile the Russians made sure the focus stayed on Iran, not Saudi Arabia. The evening of November 20, the Robotoid Carter suddenly hinted broadly at possible military action against Iran. At the same time, the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk and companion ships were ordered into the Indian Ocean. There over the horizon they will reinforce the carrier Midway and associated ships already there. Ayatollah Khomeini was given supposed evidence about the mosque takeovers in Saudi Arabia and denounced them as American and Israeli inspired. Anti-American Muslim riots erupted in several countries. The American Embassy in Islamabad, Pakistan was sacked and burned, and a Marine Guard was killed. The mosque attacks in Saudi Arabia had inflamed much of the Muslim world, except for Saudi Arabia itself. The war of words continues between Iran and the United States. On November 22, the Ayatollah called it a conflict, quote, between Islam and the heathens, unquote or in other words, a jihad. On November 26, Robotoid Carter declared the United States will discuss nothing at the United Nations except the hostages, and Ayatollah Khomeini said Iran's 20 million youths should take up 20 million rifles and prepare to fight. The next day the Ayatollah announced that the hostages will be tried. Meanwhile, the insurgents at the Embassy said that the Embassy is now wired with explosives. The White House announced a pullout of non-essential State Department personnel from 11 Muslim countries, and that day a Richter 7.3 earthquake provided new distractions for the Khomeini regime. The Battle of Tehran between the Russians and their Bolshevik Zionist enemies is building toward a climax. The Russians are convinced that the hostages are already doomed to die by their Bolshevik Zionist captors who control the situation in the Embassy and who are not true Moslems. Because of this, the Russians are prepared to take military action in Iran to block any successful Bolshevik Zionist military actions there. The stage is now set for war leading to nuclear war. But, my friends, we should reflect for a moment on how it all began. In recent weeks we have heard continually about diplomatic immunity. We are hearing that it is a terrible crime that the United States Embassy has been captured, and yet the Rockefeller Cartel captured their entire country. Is that not a crime too? In an AUDIO LETTER several years ago I stated that the real Shah of Iran was Richard Helms, then Ambassador to Iran. Having been formerly Director of the CIA, Helms was operating under the cloak of diplomatic immunity in Iran. He was in league with the forces that were holding all of Iran hostage and torturing and killing thousands of Iranians. My friends, what we need today is not immunity but accountability of everyone. We need to be rid of intrigue and maneuver, whether by Bolsheviks, Zionists, Russians, or anyone else. We need a return to fair play and a restoration of honesty and trust. We need to sweep out the cobwebs of secrecy and to light up the darkness of our world with a searchlight of truth. In Iran, we have seen a revolution take place, the revolution of Ayatollah Khomeini. Unseen forces are attempting to exploit the revolution for their own purposes, and yet it is also a very real revolution. It is an Islamic revolution of an Islamic people yearning to return to their roots. The roots of the United States of America, my friends, are Christian. But like Iran under the Shah, we too have been led far away from our roots, and what we need to do is to return to these roots in a Christian way, a way of light and truth. 
through secrecy, intrigue, and double-cross. We Americans have long since become hostages in our own land, but as our Lord Jesus Christ said so long ago, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.